I figured I'd share some things that I learned. And so this talk today is about <coughs> FRP, just functional reactive programming. And I want to highlight this part up here. It's an introduction. I am, this is not some deep dive. This is not going to jump off the deep end into functional stuff or, reaction, or reactive stuff. This is sort of just a bit of a taste as to what you can expect, what kind of concepts there are, and how you can basically start. And we'll see a couple examples of things like that, as I mentioned in the uh, synopsis, the description for the talk. Um, just kind of a quick sort of, uh, I just want to see, like how many folks are already uh, familiar with functional type programming? A few, few hands here and there, okay. How about reactive type stuff or FRP type stuff? Okay. So the agenda for today is pretty much pretty simple. We'll kind of have a little discussion about what the imperative style of programming is, what the functional style of programming are. Um, we'll jump off to a reactive, kind of take a stab at, take a look and see what that is. And then we'll see what functional plus reactive looks like. Um, I just thought it'd be a little bit of a good background to kind of compare and contrast how we do things or how we've done things for the most part in most of our careers. I know I've been pretty much doing imperative programming since I started, and I reckon most people have as well, unless you're one of the very few lucky ones to start off on something like ML or something way back in the day. Um, anyway, let's uh, get started. So most mainstream languages today, any C family language, um, they're all sort of in iterative or imperative uh, type programming languages. What that pretty much means is that you know we tell the computer how to solve a particular problem. We literally t tell it, you follow these steps, so this is what I want you to do. And that's gotten us a, a very long way today, right? And it's still probably going to be on the next, uh, you know, for the future. Um, it's very, how do you say, it's very verbose style of programming, simply because we have to be explicit about what we want the computer to do. We literally spell out how to do things here and there. And we ourselves have to keep track of all the state management that goes on. You know, imagine a UI and you have, you know, four checkboxes. Well, we ourselves have to explicitly keep track of the state of those four things. And if some, we have some business logic that operates, you know, whether two of them are active or whether three of them are active, well, we have to do that ourselves. We have to tell the computer what to do when these things happen, and which order to do them in as well. <clears throat> so that's just a bit about imperative style things. The functional programming, um, more recently, there's this thing called pure script. Is anyone taking a look at it? Just a gander. Anyway, it's uh, basically it's form of functional programming, functional programming language that compiles down to JavaScript. It's one of those sort of newer type of languages. If it piques your interest, I'd recommend checking it out. Um, there's also Clojure, which is pretty recent as well, in the last five, six years or so it came out. And it's been doing pretty well. It's a uh, dynamic type functional language. So when you hear functional languages, you, know, you shouldn't always kind of think of it as oh, it's statically typed, because there are definitely dynamically typed languages. And in functional languages, um, you basically specify what needs to be done. That is in stark contrast to how things need to be done. <coughs> Do you want to kind of get the difference? Okay. Functional programming can be viewed as a form of declarative programming. But declarative, you know, <coughs> first thing that comes to my mind when I think of declarative programming is SQL. Everyone kind of has, I think it's some, most folks here have some understanding of what SQL looks like. You know, select something from this table where x equals you know, 10 or something. And that's a very good example of declarative programming because you don't tell you know, the SQL server or the engine in the background how to get that data. You don't specify, you know, scan, do a table scan, you know, sort this column by this thing, compare this thing by this, and then give me the results by that. You don't tell it that. You just say, I need this to get done. I need this value with this inequality, 
from this table. And it just kind of figures out what needs to be done and then does it. Now, there's something magical about that part where it figures things out, right? Obviously it is. That part, parts of that, we still have to build ourselves, right? So this is not a silver bullet. This is not going to replace what we do today. But it's just another tool in our tool belt to help us sort of think differently and approach problems slightly different. You know, I'm not a zealot for any particular type of programming language, simply because I don't think you can use one language to solve all problems. And you know, we have things called general purpose programming languages for a reason, right? We can solve certain problems, we can solve most problems with them. Are they an actual good fit for that, though? That's usually the beta. Right. And in functional languages, um, you know, we use functional composition, function composition to solve a problem. And we'll take a quick look at that shortly, what that means. So function composition implies one particular thing that I can think of. But what it means to compose functions is literally, you know, let's say you have two functions, f1 and f2. And you want to, if you compose them, all you're doing is taking f1 and then calling f2 as you know, a parameter to f, you know, as to f1, basically. That's pretty much the gist of it. It's nothing more complicated than that. I thought this slide, you know, I normally don't like a lot of text, but I thought this is sort of a good comparison, contrast as to what the different Comparative approaches to functional approaches are. Um, and the things that sort of I kind of view as primarily important is more or less this first part of it here. Everything else is, is important, don't get me wrong, but I think this part is, is the most important part. With the functional approach, we pretty much transform data. We don't change the data that's given to us. Um, simply because once we start changing the data we're given, it becomes much more difficult to figure out how to get back to the original version later if you need it. Like if, let's say, for instance, you had a list of you know, 10 numbers and you want to multiply each one by two. You could do it very efficiently by doing it in place. Right? That way you're replacing the entire list with all the numbers times two. But let's say down the road you're like, oh, well, crap, I needed that old value from this other thing. Now you have a problem. <laughs> now you have to either reverse engineer or store another copy somewhere. Doing functional stuff, you always store copies. You can let the garbage collector deal with all the remnants that you're not using. So that kind of leads to saying that the functional approach to programming, to approach programming in general to solve problems, more or less requires first class functions, or pure functions, rather. With pure functions, all that means is, if you think about it in terms of math, the function gets a value. And there's an output. That's it. And those two are different. You never modify the input. You always produce a new output. Nothing more complicated than that. If anybody tells you otherwise, you should ask them why. I'm going to quickly go over the what I view as the big four functional functions, if you will. Um, these sort of lay the ground for almost every functional programming language what we're going to talk about, FRP as well. Um, the first one I already mentioned was Compose. And I'm using JavaScript ES6 uh, syntax some of the time, or mixed in with everything. So just uh, if you have any questions, please free to ask me. So let's say we create this Compose function. It's supposed to you know, merge these two functions together. Well, pretty much all, I, all it does is call function two over here with whatever parameter we're passing it, and then false function one on top of it. So, you know, something fancy, it's a tiny little thing, just chains two functions together. And this line uh, just returns a function but that takes one parameter. This returns this function there. Everyone good with that? This function, compose, takes two functions, returns a third function, which and then calls fn2 and then passes it to fn. What's the function and functional, I guess? 
terrible joke. Um, but as you see, the order of composition over here does matter. Uh, if we compose F1, Fn1, and then Ff2, and then call it with you know, 10, it produces 25. If we flip them, it will call 30, because the order of the evaluation is different. So the order of what you, what you pass to the function does matter in this case. Just keep that in mind for function composition. Um, map is another ubiquitous um, function. Everyone's probably heard of it. And if you're doing any kind of ES5 stuff even, you, know, you can use a map function to go over arrays or objects and things. And basically all that does is you map over whatever the current uh, data structure is produce new values, right? So for instance, um, we're calling map with a function where it just doubles a number. We pass an array, and this returns a new array with all the numbers doubled. And you know, this is just the definition. You take a function here, a list. This is important. We take a new list, and then we call our function onto the parameters that are there. And we return the new list. This is the function map in all its glory. It's very simple. It's very useful. And I reckon quite a lot of us use it if you're doing JavaScript stuff. Any questions? All right. Next one is filter. It's basically like map, except it runs an inequality function. And based on the truthiness of it, um, only then does it push the result into the list, the new list. So it's just, just a good way to exclude certain things, to filter out items that you want to. Simple enough? Cool. This next one is, uh, I think, one of my favorites, and also one of my favorites that took a long time to understand for me, and how to use it properly. And it's just the fold function. Um, all fold does is it takes a sequence of list, data structure, whatever you will, and it goes by one by one, and then takes an accumulator, and then you can do whatever with the accumulator and each uh, item in that data structure. All right, so for instance, I'm gonna fold with this function, I'll take two parameters, and all I'm gonna do is add them. The zero over here is my accumulator. This is my initial value, if you will. And all this function is gonna do is the first time it comes across a parameter, say one over here, passes one where A is, and passes zero where B is, and then just calls this function over here, returns that value. So the next time it comes across two, two will be in A, and then one will be in B. Right, so it just kind of accumulates, that's what the accumulator is for, to accumulate what the values are. Fairly simple. And this is something you'll see used in quite a bit of functional programming as well. Fun part about it, if you're interested in any kind of functional stuff, is you can actually write map and filter in terms of fold. Um, I'm not going to do that now because that's not relevant to our discussion, but that is a fun exercise to do. Because it just kind of makes you think, it's like, oh, you can do this, this is weird, but that's cool. Um, there's that. All right, I'm going to move on to comparing and contrasting certain things. I'll give you all you know, 10 seconds figure out what that does. Okay, one second, zero. Anybody? Looks like it's uh, pulling a bunch of commits from some kind of repository, getting all of the uh, emails into a list, and then doing a reduce on those lists to get okay. the unique ones and then returns a JSON string out of it. Okay. So all those put together. Yeah, more or less. Anyone else uh, agree with what he just said? Sorry, I can get your name. Sunil. Sunil. Anyone else agree with what Sunil said? Yeah? All right. Well, there's one little part we all missed. Sort. The sort. Yeah. Okay. Right? 10 seconds is not enough to analyze this, you know, <laughs> get it correctly. Right. I want to just kind of contrast this with how you do it in sort of functional style. So, Functional style, this is still using ES5, nothing, no new libraries, nothing like that. That's all it is. Okay. Functional style, I say. And I say style, and I put that in air quotes, simply because this line right here, it operates on the list itself. 
you know, it does all the sorting in place. But it's functional like, I wouldn't say it's functional. But, you know, this is much easier, and I hope that you would agree with me, than trying to figure out what all this does. Right? Over here, we explicitly tell the computer, you need to do this. You need to iterate over this. You need to grab this, push it in that, then sort it however you sort it. And then you hope the sorting's correct according to what you want it to, because JavaScript's not very good at sorting. We all know that. And then, you know, run our little unique checking algorithm after it's sorted. And then dump the list out as uh, JSON. Right? It's, this is imperative style. It tell the computer exactly what needs to be done. Functional style, you don't quite say exactly what needs to be done. You say what needs to be done. You say, hey, map the data and just give me the emails. Sort them. And then run this filter function, which just compares um, basically as I'm scanning across that list to see if it's already in the list. You kind of give it short little tidbits and say, hey, go do all that stuff I'm telling you to. And that works really well because you know after decades of software development, you would hope we'd have more things like this. <laughs> But unfortunately, a lot of the languages that we use don't have that capability. Uh, but JavaScript is slowly kind of heading that direction. Uh, more so with the ES6 syntax and you know, the set stuff that's coming and the, the actual maps and things like that. Um, so good times ahead. What is ES6 in terms of being useful in, let's say, a commercial environment? Yeah, so as a whole, ES6 is probably not immediately usable. There are parts which are. But if you want to use ES6 safely, um, I'd recommend looking at Babel.js, which is a transpiler. Basically, you write ES6 JavaScript, it'll compile it down to ES5 JavaScript, and then you can run that wherever you want. And produce source maps and things like that, so when you want to debug, you can. So Babel.js, that was wonderful. All right, I would hope that everyone agrees that that is much better to read, to understand, right? And a slightly better version, I personally think. <coughs> and I'm using a library called Ramda, R-A-M-D-A dot J-S. And basically I'm creating a pipeline, if you will. A data flow, pipeline, chain, whatever you want to call it. That's what that does. So say, do the mapping, it's the same sort of map as before. Sort it using this function. Grab the unique stuff, and then call stringify on the data that's passed. Much, much shorter, much clearer. And every single line produces immutable, not immutable data, but different data than the previous one before. So as in, nothing gets modified in place. Um, if you're going to use functional libraries, those two are my top two recommendations Ramda and functional.js. The not so functional ones, and I put them in that list there, which are well, very popular, actually. Underscore and Lodash are super popular and most JavaScript folks, everyone kind of knows it, basically. But they're not so functional. And the reason for that is, I mean, you can find out more at this talk. I'm not going to go into it. But basically, it was a function composition. You cannot do that in underscore. You cannot do that in lower. Um, I would recommend looking at that talk, simply because it's very informative, and you will learn a lot. Um, it's just called, hey, underscore, you're doing it wrong. That's basically it. All right, enough about that. Let's move on. Um, reactive programming. So, what is reactive? Um, I did a little search, and that's pretty much all it said. It says responsive to stimulus. If we look at that in terms of uh, computing, all that means is when some event happens, we do something. And that's what we day in and day out live and breathe, right? We always operate on some stimulus that the user inputs some other service inputs, something inputs to us, and then we go do things based on that. So that's a very simple definition. Um, don't let people confuse you with other things. <laughs> that's the simplest form that you sort of need to understand. That's all it is. Um, and if you look at reactive types of programming, basically what that means is, in a nutshell, there's reactive programming sort of lends itself to having a certain data type that represents a value over time. Right. Um, so basically, if you had a variable called x, and there's a bunch of, you want to track mouse pointer movements across the x-axis. In reactive programming, in a very general abstract way, you could say, let x equal 
the x-axis values of the mouse. That's all you would have to say. And then you can build a function on top of that to do whatever you need to do on top of the x values of the mouse. And as time progresses, x gets changed through whatever mechanism. And your functions also get notified that x changed over some other mechanism. A really simple sort of, actually not simple, but sorry, let me back up. Can anyone think of any reactive type application folks use on a daily basis? Take an action that everybody does on a daily basis. Could be an action. Um, uh, let's re resizing a window, for example. Okay. Um, causes a chain of events to occur. Perfect. That's you know that's an excellent example. You know you resize a window, events occur, things occur as some other event occurred. Right. That's all reactive sort of is. Um, and if you're thinking about data binding, observables, event propagation, property change listeners, any of those. Those are all sort of examples of reactive type programming. They're very loose definitions, very loose examples, not very constrained, but those are good examples of that. And let me just bring up pretty much one of the most um, popular reactive applications ever created by a man, basically, ever. People usually don't think this is a reactive application, but it absolutely is. You know, I enter some value here, 10, and I say, oh, okay, take that, make that 10 times 20, right? And I take this and say, this guy plus that guy. I don't know. And yeah, it's good enough. So now these two guys have some values, right, that are based on other things. If I go update this, those two change them. I don't have to do anything extra. I just simply change one value, the other two get updated. And this is an excellent example of reactive type program. You can do more fancy things, you know, you can bring in VBA and have buttons and do all this other crap and hook them up into cells themselves and get real fancy and really unmaintainable really quickly as well. Um, but this is just an example to say, you know, this is a very good example of reactive type program. You know, this is your variable, if you will. A5 is your variable here, and A3 is your variable here. You're saying, hey, A3, I want you to listen to what A1 has to say, and then do some stuff on top of it. And anytime you change this value here, other things downstream occur. Right? Other things happen. You know, you don't have to say, um, if for example, if we were to edit this, let's say, you know, you would never write something like scan the spreadsheet and give me row one, column one, and then convert that to an integer and then multiply it by 20. And then set the value back into the cell and make sure you do the next UI refresh and paint it correctly. We don't have to specify all that. Right? We've built enough abstractions to say, just do this. Sort of see the relationship to telling the computer what to do instead of how to do it. You know, somewhere, 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 someplace, you know, the folks who've created the spreadsheet application have already built up all the abstractions for us to use. And all that's left for us is to use those abstractions to solve the problems we want. The same thing kind of goes for functional programming, right? There's all these abstractions that have been built up. All that's left to us, for us to do is to compose them in a particular way, in a particular fashion, to help us solve our problems. All right. Any questions so far? Good. If I'm boring, you tell me. <laughs> we'll uh, move right on to sort of FRP. So FRP sort of just builds on the four, big four sort of functions, if you will, um, and then reactive data types. Um, in JavaScript, there is no such thing as a reactive data type. The best we can do is function with state, right? or a prototype, if you will, a class, if you will. Something that has some innards, we can't see the innards, but we can subscribe to certain notifications and changes and actions and reactions. Right? And that's what the DOM does. We say, hey, when this button on the on-click event, call me. Same thing, but 
in FRP, what happens is that model sort of extends and permeates everywhere. As in, each event, you subscribe to other events in which you do work, but those events then in turn call other events as well. So we'll take a, a quick example of that, quite quick. FRP is basically about modeling state over time. How do you do that efficiently? How do you do that in a term, in a way that's readable, in a way that's understandable? And those are the type of things that FRP sort of claims to help with. And I sort of agree with them for the most part. Not everything, but for the most part, I agree with what FRP has to offer. All right, jump straight into the code. So, I'm going to basically use a nice little form over here. We're just going to tackle how we would uh, this simple registration form. So our product manager or you know, somebody writes a little user story saying, hey, we want a registration form. We want to make sure that user enters correct email, correct password twice, and checks the box before they get registered. And we want the register button to be either on or off depending on what the values in the text boxes are and whether the checkbox is checked. So for instance, if I had an invalid email, that should be off. If I had nothing in all of them, that should also be off. But, and then if I compare these two passwords and they're same, that should be on, given everything else is on. But if these two are different lengths or less than five, then disable the button as well. So just a bunch of business logic, nothing super complicated. This is good enough, and it'll be a good jumping point to figure out what to do, or rather, how to do it. So let's just take a quick look and see. Oh, God, that's really big. <laughs> but I hope you'll get that. All right. So let's kind of take a little stab at how to do an imperative style programming language, right? Or imperative style of JavaScript. Um, this is kind of just how you have to do a jQuery, just by itself, not using other libraries or anything like that. Right? This is just an example with just jQuery. Um, set up a couple of flags, and then this general validate form that operates on those flags and says, hey, if all of that is true, then based on that, we set the disabled attribute, yes or no. Right? That's the generic validate form function. It just operates on these guys. And these guys up here are all independently set based on some property change event, basically. You know, when we blur on this email, make sure that it matches this reg regex. If it does, great, set it to the valid email. If not, show the error message and then validate the form. Call the validate form because every time you make any change to any of those form items, and we need to call that enable, re, enable disable button function, basically. Right? And so the same style over here, we're going to do for password as well. Here we'll just compare the length of it. And here we'll set, just compare the values of both of them. And if they don't match or they do match, based on that we show some stuff, we calculate. Um, same thing with error condition, or not here, same thing with the terms and agreements, same thing, right? Real boring, horribly boring things. Like, just why would you want to? Like, yeah, no, nobody likes to do stuff like this. But we do it on a daily basis. Like, this is what we do. We, we build forms and build stupid things like this. We have to keep track of all this crap. Sorry, I'm a little angry here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is what we do. We can kind of see that work. Even if you had, um, if you had the HTML5 validations in place. Apparently this is a valid email in HTML5, like anything without a uh, TLD, or without a top level domain name, like there's no dot anything basically. And I find that kind of weird that the HTML5 spec allows that, but hey, it figures. So anyway, cut that in. Um, get that, it's great. Do that, it's great. Right. And until I check this, I can't register. Right. Good enough, the form works. But what we have to do here, we have to set up a bunch of flags and do all the state management ourselves. But this is normal for us. This is what we do every day. Like This is nothing new, nothing fancy. This is, this is how we do things. All right. 
So how do you think, how do you suppose, just a wild guess here, as to how we would attack this problem using functional FRP stuff? Based on what I just told you about property changes, events, propagating, downstream. Wild guess, I would stop at the register and then go backwards from there. Good idea. So you would say what exactly? Um, the registers buttons highlight is going to be set up a dependency chain for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that the checking on each of those dependencies doesn't happen until the event is propagated from somebody actually doing something okay. on the other thing. That's just kind of a wild guess. That's a very good guess. Basically saying is this guy is supposed to have a property chain, event listener, if you will, on subscriptions upstream, basically. And based on the values in those upstream conditions, that's what will set its disabled property to yes or no. Right? <coughs> that's, a, that's a very good guess. And it's pretty close to um, what we're going to basically be doing. Um, I'm going to ask you all one question right now. I know it's 7.30. What time do you all normally get out of here? When you're in. I don't want to drag anybody along, that's all. But when you finish, that's when you leave. <laughs> so I'm asking, what time do you keep normally going. go? Normally 8.30, but we can stay till 9, 9.30. Oh, oh, I don't want to keep you here late. <laughs> that is not my intention at all. Uh, I was hoping to kind of keep this down until like an hour, basically. Because everyone's got families, everyone's got other things to do, and I understand that. I respect that. All right. Um, so what I will do, if you all are okay, I will solve this problem with you all, hand in hand, using some of the concepts that are in bacon.js. Is, is that okay, or do you want me to just show you the full example of how things work? All right, let's do it step by step. Okay. All right, so I set up this little file, something fancy. Um, and this is what the HTML file is, a bunch of stuff, including um, one cool thing. I hope more people know this. It is apparently you can set the script tag and set it to display. It's like that's kind of neat. I didn't know that. So basically, what you're seeing in, the, in this thing is the script tag definition of what's what's being rendered there. Oh, that's kind of neat. Anyway. All right, so our HTML is very simple. Um, yeah, we just have nothing complicated, nothing super fancy. Just a couple of input tags, a couple of error tags, and we've basically just hidden all the errors right now. That's all we've done. There's a submit thing at the bottom. All we have to do is to check if the value that's produced by the email uh, field event, some event, blur event, let's just say, is matches a particular regular expression. And based on that, it's either valid or it's invalid, right? And that sort of translates to a Boolean property, whether it's true or false. Yes or no, it's valid. Or, yeah, that's basically it. So let's set that up. Let's set call it valid email. This guy, and let's say um, we have to operate something on the, on the on the tag itself, on the field. In Bacon, what you can do with Bacon.js, and similarly with RxJS as well, that's another thing you want to look into. We'll use Bacon here. Is you can get event streams or a stream of events from any particular source. In this case, our source is going to be our email field. HTML field. And the events are simply going to be uh, what the event property would be for whichever event we choose. Right? So we can say, um, give me a stream of you know, the, 
more property change event, basically. And so what this statement in of by itself does, it sets up a streaming uh, object, if you will, of values that come as they occur. So let's just, I just want to show you. Uh, let's just do a log on that. Bacon API is pretty much all chainable for the most part. It's actually 99.9% .9 all of it's chainable, so you can kind of build things on top of each other, which is kind of useful. Um, so let's just call it, <coughs> yeah, let's just go run that and see what happens. Uh, dev console, this is going to be tiny, I apologize for that. I don't know if you can control the font here or not. Um, but hey look, our stuff's going to help. And the tab, and hey look, there's an event stream, or an email stream rather. And as you'll see over here, and I'm sorry, I apologize that it's really tiny over here to look at, but the object that gets passed to us is just the JavaScript native event property from the DOM. Or in this case, it's from jQuery. Right? Bacon can work with jQuery. This is what, that's what the as event stream does. It builds stuff off of a, uh, a Bacon stream off of whatever field, whatever thing you want it to. So over here, it pretty much just gives us um, a, a regular property. So, you know, I type some more stuff and I hit tab, just get another event. So what we're interested in over here is the contents of that field, right? We don't care about anything else, we just want the contents of it. Uh, simple enough. So let's just say uh, we want to map the event target, or the event property that's given, the event object that's given to us. We want to take the target's value in it, right? Because that's what we're interested in. In Bacon, what you can do is you can pass it a string that sort of looks like a chain of properties, and Bacon will go extract that for you. So that's kind of useful. It, there's not really a great way to do that in JavaScript natively. So it's like, hey, give me a string, I'll figure it out, and I'll give you the property that you're referring to inside of the string. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Updated. And down there it's just giving us Jonathan basically. And it's updated to current. Right, so it's just mapping some things. It's just like a regular event for now. Alright, so we want to take that and then we basically want to see whether it's matches some regular expression or not. Right, so what we can do is we can pass in a function. and pass the function value that says, hey, does it match <coughs> some regular expression? We'll put our regular expression here. A bunch of words followed by at, a bunch of words followed by a period, and a bunch of words, uh, what's that, plus to all. Good enough? Good enough. Let's go run this. Oh, it says it's false. It doesn't match our regular expression. So now, now it says it's true. Great, hooray, we've done something. Um, <laughs> I'm going to add this little line here called to property. I'm going to specify, I'm going to talk about a couple of things here. In Bacon, I said, I've, I've told you up until this point, these three lines up here produce an event stream, right? And Bacon has two primary objects in One's called an event stream, one's called a property. An event stream is a sequence, if you will, of events, event properties that fire over time, that have fired over time. A property is simply one instance captured in some constant from those event streams. And it's the latest property value. It's the latest event. It's the latest event stream converted to some constant, basically. Right? That's all that is. So Properties, you can only have one property, it will only have one value ever when you create a property. An event stream can have a bunch of different things inside of it. A property can only have one thing inside of it. Think about it that way, it becomes slightly more clear. Because what you can do up here, if I didn't have this property down here, um, I can take that, create another, conceptually if you think about it, sorry, I'm gonna make you think about it rather, you can create another event stream and say subscribe it to the other stream as well. 
and then take the contents of that string and bring it in for me as well <coughs> to read. Whereas in a property, you can't do that. Property, you can only get the latest value. That's all it is. So anyway, convert it to a property, and um, basically we'll assign it, or rather, let's put it this way. So we have a convert to a property, which is going to be you know, true or false based on this previous line over here, because that's all test returns. Test returns, true or false. Did you mean map or filter in the second map? Um, map, because we want to keep whether it's <coughs> true or false, because we don't want to filter anything away, because we want to show an error message, right? When it's when the value is the, the regex doesn't match, we want to show some error message. So we have to keep both those uh, things. The cool thing with properties in Bacon is you can assign properties to things, right? You have if you view events as sort of source of the events, a source of changes, the property is sort of where the sink is, like where it all goes into. Right? So what we can do is we can assign that property um, into something. So I'm going to use some little syntax here, and I'll explain what I've done. This is just a jQuery object, right? It's just a function, if you will. And then we're going to say, Toggle class that seems familiar. We'll say that so it seems familiar, and we'll kind of leave it at that. So what this is going to do, and this is some special notation for uh, Bacon's assign function, is we can say, hey, assign this to this function, call this method with some number of parameters, and the last parameter it will pass to this object method n number of parameters is what the value of the property is. All right, so what I'm expecting to happen here from this assign statement is that toggle class will get called with the hidden class passed to it based on the property of you know, whether that email is correct or not. Well, I am missing one particular piece, and I'm pretty sure somebody raised their hand for it. Okay, so I'm going to grab whatever the next, the closest. Um, Error tag is so the error tag will either show up or not. Previously, the email tag would go up. We don't want that. All right. It's saying over here, log is not a function. That's because um, when you assign something, it's a terminating. You're basically terminating the API. You can no longer get back. <coughs> it's kind of like if you do jQuery some object dot get. Like you can't do jQuery after that, basically. So let's chop this off. Go on this. Chop. Well, you put the log in before that terminating statement, or the log is terminated as well? Log is log passes things or passes things on. So you could put log here. Okay. Uh, you could put it before the terminating case, okay. and that's perfectly fine. And over here, just a simple example. Um, forget the log part. But you can kind of see that we're telling, in some sense, we're telling Bacon what to do. Yeah, we're no longer keeping track of state ourselves. We're sort of deferring that and saying, hey, you know how to take care of some sort of state via a sign. So you just go do that. We don't longer have to keep a counter somewhere. We don't longer have to keep a flag somewhere. We basically say, hey, I need this to get done. We don't specify how to go do the thing. So what's the two property doing over there? Uh, it's converting it to a bacon property object, which the property object only has the last value of the event string. Can you show that and put a log statement in front of the two property to show what it was trying to Yeah, it's me. going to be the same value uh, for now. So. So before it says false and after it says false. Right now over here, there's not much of a differentiation because this event stream that we've created doesn't have any subscribers. <coughs> there's no other event streams depending on this one. 
once you start doing that, then things become more interesting because then you can kind of compose event streams together. Let's kind of go quickly tackle uh, some of that. All right. I'm not going to excuse me, where did the p dot error dot and where it come from? That's up here. That's this guy over here. Okay, it's a CSS selector. Yeah, it's a CSS uh, sibling sort of selector. Fuzzy sibling selector, basically. That's what it is. <coughs> All right, in the interest of time, I'm not going to type out every single thing, but I will paste a couple of things, and um, yeah, I will let's talk about that. All right, I'm going to paste the password you know, event stream over here, and paste the password to event stream over here as well. This is basically the same as this, right? Oops, sorry. All we're doing is we're saying, hey, on the blur event, do something, and then get the target value. <coughs> Nothing more complicated than that. Over here, and I'm going to move this off, start with a jump, is where things get slightly more interesting. Right? Over here, we're saying, Hey, Bacon, combine with this function some number of, of event streams. What Bacon's going to do over there is going to take this pass one event stream up here, the pass two event stream up here, and then pass them into our function, the values of whatever those two are, so that we can do something with it. And over here, what we're doing is we're comparing things. So the result of Bacon not combined with this entire statement is that we will return a Boolean stream of either trues or false. That, um, do you have to have a simple uh, expression in there, or can you do something like a lambda expression that you can do more fully functional? Yeah, yeah, you can. You know, whatever your event stream produces, whether it's constants or objects or Ajax streams or anything else, okay. you can compare those inside there. So any amount of logic you need to do inside those, I'm keeping it simple just yeah, to kind no, of express things. But yeah, you can definitely do a lot more. You don't have to simply use lambdas. You can use a full-blown function if you want to. All right, um, so great. We've got a, you know, whether the passwords are equal stream or not, producing what the true or false is. Um, so let's do something with that, right? Up here, um, on the email part, we've seen that we set, we use a sign, right, to assign that property into some function. I'm going to use something slightly different here, just to kind of show you another way of doing it. You'll notice over here, for either of these, I, I haven't used the toProperty function. Right? I've not used those here. And I use that to kind of show you how you can do things slightly differently. So these two over here are, are event streams. I've combined the event stream here to combine those values into one event stream over here. Right? I've kind of merged them, if you will. And over here, I'm showing you a little function that you can call on event streams called on value. Now on value is more or less kind of like a sign, but on value only works on event streams. So anytime an event stream has a value to produce, um, it'll call your function with that value. So over here, all we're taking is taking that value, and then we're calling it on the not equal thing, and we're talking in the class of it. Right. Over here, we're using an explicit jQuery not in a string function with a couple of parameters. Whereas over here, we're using some strings and stuff. So if you have personal preference, you can do it this way, or you can do it this way. That'll be good. So in effect, it does the same exact thing. So let's see if this works. Seems OK. Seems OK. Why can't you do that as part of the previous, uh, if you go back to your code? Why can't you do that uh, the on value right next to the combined with, and the combined with the end, so you can do that. Sure. Yeah, you can definitely do that. You can basically chain this and do, you know, on value, whatever you want. That's perfectly fine as well. The reason I, the reason to to do this rather to split this into its own event <coughs> stream is that down here when, now when, sorry, 
it back up. When we mentioned functional reactive programming, right? There's that word functional. What Bacon does over here is that for this particular you know, construct, or Bacon.combine, it produces an event stream. On any subsequent API calls, guess what it does? It also produces another event stream because it doesn't want to change all the things that are in between. And what that allows you to do is to take, build up part of a, an event stream, combine that with other things, and then continue using it however you want without affecting what the other subscribers were doing. And so that's a pretty, pretty good benefit of that. All right, so password equals, and you can guess similarly, the password length is going to be basically More or less the same exact thing. Right, so over here we just say get the password to event stream and map it where the make sure that the length is greater than five. If not, or if if or if not, it doesn't really matter. You know, pass the attribute along down here. Right? So now we have this. The passwords are equal, but it's like hey. That password don't match. Great. <coughs> okay. So we sort of take that away. And this code is basically saying, hey, do that thing that I told you to do. You know, this is, we don't tell it how to do it. We say, this is what you should do. We just kind of state it because there's abstractions built on top of us, or for us, rather. So we've seen one example of how to combine a couple of streams, right? And if you can guess, um, the disable property on the button can also be combined by upstream. Right? Let's quickly go copy the, uh, the terms were checked or not. And basically, this is the part. All we're doing is we're mapping it and we're just saying, uh, has this been checked using the jQuery you know, is selected? That's all we're doing. And all this will do is produce, again, a bunch of booleans, true or false. Nothing more than that. So here comes the fun part. Anyone want to take a, just a quick little guess as to how we would um, implement the submit enabled? It's true or false. You combine all the previous streams? Yeah, just combine all the previous ones. You know, we basically say, hey, Bacon, go ahead and combine with, and over here we're, pass we're gonna pass it four uh, properties. We'll say, hey, take this valid email, password equals length, and make sure the terms check. Um, then we convert it to a property, and we do some <coughs> funny things over here. Ignoring the funny things, um, we just say set the attribute or disabled, basically. The funny things we're doing here is that we're saying, since we're converting to this property, please use this initial property value the first time you go run your things, basically. And I'll show you why we do that over here. And then we're, what we're doing this next line is we're saying, just flip it. If it's true, it's said to not true. If it's false, it's not false. That's, that's all we're doing over here, right? So let me exclude this part, and we'll see what our page looks like. So, um, full refresh. Okay, everything's refreshed. That's what our page looks like. This button's active. That's not cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that's incorrect. Like we should not do that. Let's fill this out. If I check that guy. If I uncheck it, oh look, now it works. But if I check it, it works. If I uncheck it, oh look, now it doesn't. Which is sort of what we want, but. When the page loads, you know, it's, it's enabled. And the reason for that is that this uh, property over here doesn't have any starting value. Because it has no starting value, nothing downstream gets fired. Bacon's also sort of lazy. 
It's like, I'm not going to compute anything unless I have somebody who's interested in some values that I have. So it's very performant as well. And you can definitely screw it up, and I've done that. Uh, but by default, um, you know, it's pretty lazy, and because it's lazy, it's quite performant. So you don't really have to worry about too much stuff about it. So because that property doesn't have any value, that button doesn't get enabled. But if we say, hey, use this starting value, false, then the rest sort of works. Um, so if we kind of go, hey, look, it magically works. All right. Does it have to wait until all the streams have been run through before? Yes. 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 It has to. Right? Because none of those streams have any initial values because no action on them occurred. So for instance, if we were to say, um, over here, if we converted this to a property and set it to true for some reason, right? For the terms condition, we should change that to a property and set it to true. If we enter the email and passwords, then that button would work, even though that term and condition button is not checked. So you can do hooky things like that. Sometimes maybe necessary, depending on what your requirements are, but hopefully not too much of, too much of the time. stuff, basically. FRP. You can hook things up, you can chain things together, and you can say, hey, depending on what these other things are, this is what your state should be. And that, to me, is a pretty powerful concept. And this is a very simple example. Um, you can do other things, like you can create a spider of AJAX requests, basically. I was talking to Tony back there earlier. I said, you know, imagine a use case where um, somebody gave you access to the GitHub API and was like, hey, Find all the committers, well, the last 10 unique committers <coughs> in this particular project, and then go find their projects and get the last commit date for all their projects as well. You know, that's, you're creating one request to get that AJAX data in general. You're doing some transformation, you know, get the unique emails or whatever it is, and then you're gonna go create an N requests per email, find those repositories for each one of those guys and do N more per user to find the last commit date, right? So it's a big tree of stuff that you can do. And you can model that using FRP very well, I might add. And especially when it comes to terms to error messaging, error handling, things like that, that stuff is baked right in. Um, it's pretty darn cool. Like, I enjoy working with it. Um, just to kind of show you, I guess, example. This is a simple AJAX example, just to show that you can. Um, let's just take a look at this. Yeah. So let's just assume that you know, we've got this AJAX function that's always going to return success. And all it's doing is calling jQuery AJAX. I'm using this HTTP bin service, and it's expecting a JSON data type. Um, and this failure one's always going to fail with like a 400 or 500 or something like that. Or in this case, it will be a 400. If you ignore this part, because it's not really relevant to our thing. This part down here is. In this part, we're using some raw bacon functions. We're calling from event. And from event, all it's doing is listening to the click event of this particular thing. We're basically saying, hey, when something happens with this click event, um, call this function flat map with this function that yields you know, bacon up from promise, basically. What flat map does and this is kind of important, I guess, in any kind of reactive application, um, including, you know, ACA, Scala, stuff as well, if you're doing backend work. That flat map over here, what flat map does, is that when an event gets generated over here, right, through this event stream, this event stream gets called with some particular value in here, but I'm not taking any value, I'm just ignoring it, basically. But what this from promise function does is that it creates another event stream. It's not a mapping function, it's a flat map. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to generate another event stream 
from which it's going to track this promise value that jQuery is providing, basically. Based on the success of that promise, failure, success, whatever it is, it'll wrap that in the bacon style of the event stream as well. And then it'll just collapse that event stream into this event stream. So that you don't have an event stream generating an event stream, and now you've got like two layers deep of event streams. It just takes this and puts it back in here. That's all sort of flat map does. And so when you want to gather that data, all you have to do is say, generate some you know, endpoints, basically. It says, on the value of this, do this. On when there's an error, do that. And the cool thing is you can combine those as well. So right up here, I've basically combined these two event streams. Or, oh, sorry, over here. I've merged all their values, whatever their values are. And then they will all filter it after here, basically. So regardless of whether it was this uh, the failure stream or the success stream, all their events get funneled into one event stream and I can handle them myself. Okay. I don't think this is going to run because, yeah. See, this one was mapped to the success one, but I don't have a Wi-Fi connection, so it failed. And so it showed the correct one. Right. Um, this one should show the same thing. Yeah, failed as bad as zero. So it doesn't matter which one I click on. Um, that's where it is. And just to prove that I'm not faking it, I have the same stuff here that I've done. <laughs> um, nothing fancy. So you can kind of combine, if you will, event streams, merge them, uh, do all sorts of fun stuff with them. If you look at the API reference, you see, it's not a strip of bacon, but it's Sir Francis Bacon with sunglasses on. That's what it is. Oddly enough, I've heard somebody, I kid you not, somebody complained that the name was Bacon, not JS, and that would be offensive to somebody. I was like, really? It's food. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big deal. Anyway, um, what I found personally attractive to Bacon JS versus, say, something like RxJS was that the documentation is just much more comprehensive. Um, and I'm a big believer in documentation. In terms of, you're gonna, especially if you're going to create libraries for other people to use, they they should be, they must be well documented. Um, the RxJS library just sort of falls flat in its face on that. They sort of defer you and ask you to go look at the Rx Java um, API documentation. There's not always just a one to one mapping. Most of the time there is, but the, again, the terminology and things that they use in there are a little bit more. I don't want to say academic, but it sort of leans on that side of academia. And just sort of understanding those concepts as a developer can take a little bit of a time. That's not to say that Arc's family of libraries, they're not useful. They are absolutely very useful. You can do some extremely powerful things with them. Hell, Netflix has built their whole infrastructure on top of RxJS, or Arc's Java, if you will. Um, so there's definitely value in that. It's just the learning curve is like whoop up here, basically, simply because there's so much in there. And the model of API that they use in, in terms of uh, their flavor is a little bit different. And they have a few different uh, terminologies that are here than Bacon does. Bacon I find to be a bit more simplistic. And it works well enough for me to use it in JavaScript. If I have to do something like Java or other things to deal with a whole bunch of UI work, I would definitely go jump on RxJ Java. If I had to do Android, I would use it. That's what I would do. Um, so, but in JavaScript land, this is good enough for me. If you explore the API, they've got some really useful concepts and constructs in there as well. And they kind of give you good enough examples as to where you can kind of play around with it and figure things out. Um, there's definitely a shortcoming of full-fledged examples. That's saying, you know, hey, here's a full application. Um, that's not to say that they don't have a to-do MVC, which everybody does. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, you can. Um, but yeah, in general, that's sort of my take on you know, functional reactive programming is that you, s you specify what needs to be done based on abstractions that are built up. You don't specify how to do exact, exact things. You know, they've, they've got some really, there's a nice little function called combine template. 
the day can, what combined template does is it takes a JSON object where you specify the keys and the values are other event streams or properties. And so at the end of that combined template thing, what you'll end up having is based on your changes in somewhere upstream, you have a new little JSON value that's always up to date with whatever the latest stream changes are. Doing that is a pain <laughs> in just imperative imperative land. Because, um, I mean, if you look, think about it this way, if, let's say you put your application state in this JSON object, you capture it, that is extremely hard to do, especially when your application is not a registration form. Right? Like if it's like a music player, or if it's like a master detail page, or a shopping cart, or anything slightly more involved, basically. Keeping track of the entire application, having it sort of reactive is challenging without a little bit of help, either via you know, some other libraries, some other framework to handle it for you. But using reactive type stuff just makes it so much more easy. Um, and there's definitely integrations for baking with other libraries like Backbone or with Angular even, or with React as well. Um, so if you're interested in that, I highly recommend checking this out further. Um, this is not a library that kind of lives on its own. It works extremely well with others because it doesn't assume anything about the outside world. It just says, I've got these terminating functions. Just call me to do stuff at the end of them. Um, it's very unassuming, and I, I appreciate that. Um, let's see, a couple of resources. I'll put this deck on the uh, user group page for you all to kind of take the links and things out of here. Um, one resource I found to be really useful, um, just in terms of understanding reactive type programming, FRP stuff, is um, this little uh, gist that uh, Sam, I think, something, I don't know if he rewrote, but it's really useful, as in, but he talks about RxJS, which is perfectly fine with me, because understanding concepts, they sort of bleed in together. Um, but it's, I, I'd highly recommend reading that. He kind of calls out the bullshit of all the um, academic type other libraries that are out there. He's like, listen, you don't need to talk about this these abstract levels, people can get it if you just show them a couple examples. Right, I, I like that. Um, there's a custom stack overflow about functional reactive, and the top answer that is accepted is useless. Like, like utterly useless. It talks about all the academic stuff, which is fine from that perspective, but the better answer is the one right next to it, right underneath is like the second answer that actually just gives you a simple example of what FRP is in a nutshell. Um, explore that, if you will. And obviously the bacon one is there as well. Um, yeah, that's all I had. Does anybody have any questions about anything? What's the current stability like? It's pretty stable. It's been out for like four years or something like that. It's pretty rock solid. Um, not much has changed. And oddly enough, that kind of scares me, but then also, it's like, oh, it's been stable for a very long time. So, it's half and half there, sort of. Is there only one person maintaining it, or is there a few? There's a few folks. It's mostly a one-man thing, but there's contributors and things as well. It's on GitHub, so it makes it a lot more transparent, so that kind of thing. Um, yeah. You mentioned you used it at work. Uh, what type of interesting projects have you used it on? Interesting form projects. Yeah, the form is one thing. Um, basically, the project I'm using it currently is basically a payment management system. And just I'm using FRP Bacon just to handle UI state changes. Uh, one of the most simplest, like most productive things I did was uh, fill the browser for to work on the hash, the change event, the location change events, like iffy. You don't, it fires the events at the wrong time. Um, so we just kind of went back to just using the on hash change, if you will, right? And even that's sort of hokey, because if the user enters that twice or does a bunch of stuff, like, you can have duplicates and whatnot. Um, and duplicate events fire and whatnot. Um, but using FRP, I seriously I wrote a little router in like maybe 10 lines of code, simply because you don't have to do a lot of work to get it done. You can take Vague and say, listen to this property, throw out all the duplicates, and when you find something that matches in this map, call that function. That's the end of it. Like, it's simple. Like, it's not complicated. It gets out of your way. Uh, 
That's like the most productive 10, 15 lines of code I've ever wrote. It's just tiny. Tell the computer, hey, do this. But would you need a different kind of a debug mechanism or workflow to keep track of what even some getting in or That is a good point. So this is sort of where um, some of the things tend to become a little bit hairy is when you're debugging combinations of event streams. Right? I'm not going to say this is easy, simply because we do not have the tools to kind of support yeah. that. All our debuggers assume imperative. Like that's what they assume. They don't assume I can track things over time. They track things now, and that is the only time they track things. So that definitely makes it challenging. Um, unfortunately, I don't see that getting any better in the JavaScript land, uh, or even in any land, actually, for that matter, simply because it is tough. It is a hard thing to do. Uh, capturing and modeling state over time is difficult. It is not an easy thing to do, especially when it comes to debugging it which is why at least you have console logs. <laughs> That's the minimal you know, help you can kind of get. Yeah, short of pretty much turning on a debugger and, I don't know, things you normally do, basically. Nothing more than that. Um, I'll throw a little plug in for myself. Uh, I've got a little quit that I got a contact right now. Basically, you know, Anybody who's looking for a couple of Angular devs or whatever, um, or rather, I am looking for a couple of Angular devs. If you have any interest or know anybody who does, let me know. Or any kind of other senior JavaScript person, basically. Um, that's it from my end. Any other questions, comments? Well, I think that's a wrap up then. Thanks.